Jews are often referred to as the people of the book. This is actually a designation given by Muslims to both Christians and Jews. They were monotheists with a written revelation. That was the category of Ahl al-Kitab in Arabic. But Jews adopted that moniker for themselves because it really reflected one of their most important values, the focus on the written word, the spoken word. People talk today about multiple intelligences, different learning styles. Jewish culture definitely prized the verbal, whether it was the discussion, the debate, and the argument, the writing and the commentary, the storytelling based on earlier stories. It's all about words, 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 as Shakespeare wrote. In fact, uh, one of my favorite Israeli authors, um, Amos Oz, and his daughter, Fania Salzberger, uh, oh, Salzberger I'm sorry, um, wrote a book called Jews and Words, all about this phenomenon of Jewish connections to words and speaking. One of the challenges, though, is the assumption that Jewish culture and Jewish creativity was only about words. It was only the Talmud and commentaries and the Bible and commentaries and rabbis and arguments and words, words, words. In fact, Jewish culture has a rich history of art, even of figurative art of humans and animals that is not always reported. In fact, sometimes people go to Jewish museums and are shocked to find what they thought Jews did not do. Because in fact, Jews have always done what some thought Jews should not do, both in the past and of course today. Now this concept of Jews only relying on um, the written word for creativity goes back to a passage in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and we're going to share our window here to look at this. This is Exodus chapter 20, which is in fact the Ten Commandments. And if you know the Hebrew, in fact, the word for the Ten Commandments is not the Ten Commandments, it is the Ten Words. Aseret dibrot from Daber, to speak, or words. The Ten Sayings, and sometimes it's even just the initial words on the iconography of the two tablets that you might see in a conventional synagogue. And so you have the early commandments that talk about uh, Yahweh, the Hebrew God, being the only God. And then you'll notice very early on, you will have no other gods before me here in verse 3. And in verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol, nor any image of anything that is in the heavens above, or is in the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. Do not bow down to them, don't serve them. I will visit the sin of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Well, not so nice. But you can see here the strong prohibition on making an image of anything, anywhere. Nothing on the heavens above, no stars, no birds, nothing on the earth beneath, no animals, no, no moles, I mean, nothing. Even no fish because of anything in the water under the earth. No idols or images. A very strong prohibition. In fact, so strong that later on in the Hebrew Bible, close to a recapping of the Ten Commandments, because the Ten Commandments appear both in Exodus chapter 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Here in Deuteronomy chapter 4, as uh, Moses is giving his recap of Hebrew history, he reminds them of what happened when they saw the God and received these commandments. Here you have in verse 9, Be careful, keep your soul diligently, lest you forget what your eyes saw, and depart from your heart all the days of your life. Tell them to your children and to your children's children. Even your grandchildren need to know this. The day you stood before Yahweh, and Yahweh said, Assemble all the people. In verse 11, you came near and stood under the mountain. The mountain burned with fire to the heart of the sky, with darkness and cloud and thick darkness. Here in verse 12 is the key line. Yahweh spoke to you out of the middle of the fire. You heard the voice of words, but you saw no form. You only heard a voice. And reiterated in verse 15, be very careful. For you saw no kind of form on the day that Yahweh spoke to you in Horeb out of the middle of the fire, lest you corrupt yourselves and make yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, of any fish in the water under the earth, unless you lift your eyes to the sky, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, the army of the sky, you'll be drawn away and worship them and serve them. No forms, 
no idols, no carving, no pictures, no figurative art. And so people who are familiar with the Ten Commandments, with the Hebrew Bible and its prohibitions in Deuteronomy, assumed that Jews simply did not do this. In fact, if you found an archaeological site and you found statues there, the assumption was it must be a Canaanite site. It must be those other peoples, the Philistines, the Hittites, the Jebusites, some other people. It could not be a Hebrew site because the Hebrews didn't do this. Now, we know that it's not quite that simple. We know that people do what people do, and it may not be what the authorities tell them not to do. Now, we also have to realize that Jewish culture is often influenced by the cultures around it. And so if the Canaanites and other peoples are worshiping fertility goddesses and other beings, then perhaps Jews learn from their neighbors, just as Jews over time learned different clothing, different alphabets, different languages, different foods. There's a reason why Middle Eastern Jewish food is very different from Ashkenazi Jewish food. It's because they learn from the peoples around them as they traveled. And so the same is true in all kinds of other aspects of culture. In Islamic art, for example, if you ever go to uh, Jerusalem, actually there's a wonderful museum of Islamic art, but in any museum of Islamic art, you'll notice that in most Muslim cultures, not all, but in most, there are very strict limits on figurative art. You can depict plants, you can depict geomet geometry, geometrical designs, and you can do calligraphy. And you'll notice if you see pictures of the inside of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, for example, beautiful, huge calligraphy. But no people and no animals. That is not allowed in most Muslim iconography. Sometimes Shiite Muslims in Persia did do human forms, but the dominant Sunni trait is no people, just plants and geometry and calligraphy. And in the Byzantine Empire, which is the Eastern Christian Empire, there was a massive iconoclastic controversy in the 8th and 9th century of the Common Era where they too read Deuteronomy and said, we should have no images and no forms. And they went around and destroyed the beautiful paintings and frescoes and mosaics that decorated Byzantine churches all over the Byzantine Eastern Christian Empire. In fact, the only remnants of artwork we can find from that period are in the most isolated monasteries and nunneries of the Eastern Orthodox Church. All the rest were destroyed. Later on, they softened that, and you'll see iconography in Eastern Orthodox churches even today and from after the 9th century. But in that window, they were so opposed to it, they actually went back and destroyed the images that had been there. And so we'll see some of these challenges for the use of human forms and the use of animal forms in the kind of art that Jews created over time. But we'll also find out that Deuteronomy and Exodus are simply one perspective on this, and archaeology offers a very different version. Now, the next image I'm going to show you may be very familiar, not from Sunday school, not from biblical study, but let's see if you can place that image. You see the image with the two poles to carry, the two golden-winged angels kneeling on top of an ark? This is a depiction, an artist's depiction, of the Ark of the Covenant, where the tablets of the Ten Commandments were kept. And if you recognize that image, I would bet you a nickel that you recognize that image because of the movie Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. This is Jewish art. This is Jewish figurative art, described and prescribed in the Hebrew Bible. It says very clearly to design the ark like this with angels that look like this. We'll see the text in just a moment. And when you read other passages in the Hebrew Bible, you begin to wonder what's going on here because Deuteronomy says nothing of anything and you saw no form. But then if you flip back a little bit and you read Exodus chapter 24, you see this. After a covenant is made, in verse 9, Moses, Aaron, Nadav, Avihu, these are Aaron's sons, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up. They saw the God of Israel under his feet. His feet? Under his feet 
was like a paved work of sapphire stone, like the sky for clearness. He didn't lay a hand on the nobles of the children of Israel. They saw God and ate and drank. Doesn't say what was served. But the more important part of this verse is they saw God. What's going on here? In fact, it's the very next chapter in Exodus 25 that you get the description of how to design the ark. You'll notice it's to be overlaid with pure gold. You have rings on the sides with poles in the rings. And here in verse 17, you make a mercy seat of pure gold. You make two cherubim, two winged angels of hammered gold. You make them at the two ends of the mercy seat, one at each end. Um, they will spread out their wings upwards, covering the mercy seat with their wings, their faces towards one another. You put the mercy seat on top of the ark. So it's clearly describing to make this statue of two winged angels. This is prescribed to be done in the very same Torah. And then there's this episode in the book of Numbers. The people grumble against God and against Moses. We're starving. We hate the, we're sick of manna. We're sick of the, the food you've been giving us. It stinks. And so the Hebrew God is not one to take criticism lightly. In verse 6, he sends venomous snakes among the people. They bit the people, and many people died. The people came to Moses and said, We've sinned, we've spoken against Yahweh and against you. Please take the serpents away from us. And Yahweh said to Moses in verse 8, Make a venomous snake and set it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten will see it and live. Moses made a serpent of bronze and set it on the pole. And if the serpent had bitten any man, he looked at the serpent of bronze, and he lived. What is this? In later times, this is described as Nehushtan, the bronze serpent that Moses made. You also have this molten sea, which is a special laver of bronze that's held by carved oxen. That's also prescribed for the temple in Jerusalem, in Solomon's temple. Ultimately, when we read later passages in the Hebrew Bible, we realize what happened. Because the later texts say all that imagery stuff was bad. It shouldn't have been done. Now, they don't say Moses did wrong. They don't say that Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers are wrong. They're not going to say that. But we get the sense here that there was a revolution in Jewish thought that changed what it meant to worship a god and to do figurative art. The king, this is King Josiah, around the year 620 of the, uh, before the Common Era, he commanded the high priests and the priests of the second order, the keepers of the threshold, to bring out all the vessels made for Baal, the Canaanite god, for Asherah, the fertility goddess, and all the army of the sky. He got rid of the idolatrous priests, that were ordained to burn at the high places. He brought out the Asherah, the sacred pillar, the fertility goddess from Yahweh's house and burned it at the brook of Kidron and beat it to dust and cast down its dust on the graves of the common people. He brought out all the priests from the city of Judah. He broke down the high places of the gates. He defiled Tophet in the valley of Hinnom. He took away the horses the king of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance of Yahweh's house and so on, and so on, and so on. He broke in pieces the pillars, cut down the Asherah poles, and filled their places with men's bones. So what you get here is a clear sense not only of hostility, but also of a revolution in Jewish thought, because before Josiah, you had hundreds of years of Hebrew kingdoms where these things were allowed. There was a small reformation about 100 years before under Hezekiah, where Hezekiah got rid of the bronze serpent Nehushtan that was attributed to Moses. But all this stuff came back, because that's what Jews had been doing. And we even have archaeological confirmation for this revolution, because we found a trove of fertility goddesses dating, dating back to about the time of King Josiah, around the year 620 before the Common Era. But these fertility goddess statues have been intentionally broken in half. At one time, they were treasured heirlooms. A theological revolution later, they're garbage to be broken and dumped. So how do we make sense of this? 
what happened here. And how do we make sense of a Jewish tradition that seems to speak on the opposite sides of the same issue? Is the reform of God, does he have feet, or did you see no form? Are you prohibited from making any image, or are you allowed to make images only for the temple, or can you even have images of other gods in earlier versions of Judaism? So here I want to stop for a moment, and I want to ask you your thoughts on how can we reconcile this? How can we make this make sense? This prohibition on figurative art, is it moot? Is it only operative at certain times? How did it come about that they're both there in the same sources? What do you think? Well, given the time periods that you gave, I was just thinking maybe there was a correlation between what Christians were doing and Jews, but the time doesn't match because this was before. A long time before, yes. A long time before. But um, so, of course, these writings are done by men, people, men, and something happened perhaps politically within within the group of, of those who were, who were writing to give forth different perspectives and different laws. I mean, I don't have an answer, obviously. I was just kind of... Um, well, maybe, maybe that's an interesting uh, point, to point out that it's men who are writing the sources. They might have been less connected to a fertility cult. I mean, they needed fertility, obviously, for humanity to survive, but they didn't need to see themselves, they didn't need to see a female form projected as divinity because they could assume the default was a male form. Um, you know, when they saw God's feet, and they, if they looked up, they probably would have seen a he and not something else. So in this case, um, it may be the, the, the case that the fertility cult was more treasured by women. In fact, there's an interesting episode in the book of Jeremiah, which we're not going to look at today, where the women of Jerusalem come to Jeremiah after it's been destroyed and say, you see, we did it all wrong. Everything was fine when we worshipped the Queen of Heaven, but now that you got rid of all those fertility statues, she got mad, and she let the city be destroyed, and now we're in exile and we're suffering. We should go back to the old-time religion and worship the Queen of Heaven. Um, so Jer Jeremiah reads the history the opposite way. He said, no, all that Queen of Heaven worshipping you did is a problem. That's what caused the destruction. So they're arguing on either side of the issue. Jeremiah represents the dominant strain that winds up editing the Bible, but uh, the, the women are representing an alternate voice in Jewish history. So, so I wonder um, how different we are, you know, so far in the future from, from people back then, and to piggyback off of Emma's commentary it's like the people in charge decided whatever was going on was not conducive to the politics of the time and they needed to change the narrative and and so it's like this isn't working so we're just going to change what we're talking about we're going to break literally break these uh, these idols and rewrite everything and say everything from the past, all of this imagery is needs to be wiped out so that we can create a new narrative. Okay. So we have the evolution of ideas, but also the rewriting of history, you know, the changing of what it meant in the past and what it means now, where it might have been the dominant tradition, now it becomes a diversion from the true tradition. Yeah, Sheila, please. Well, you know, it, it's, it's not unusual in other religions to have that dynamic between sort of, if you will, the liberals, the conservatives, and those who want to reform. So, it, you know, that's not an unusual history. I think the difference is that ours is somewhat earlier than, than some of the others. But even, even in Roman and, 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 and Greek mythologies, there were, there were changes in which, do, which gods were predominant and um, the different cults and people who sort of gave that up and were looking at other things. Um, certainly it's true uh, in, in 
Christianity with the, the split between the Roman Catholics and the Greek Orthodox and then the Reformation. Um, so that's not unusual in, in religious history to find that there are people who want to, for whatever reasons, sometimes it's dominance and control, um, sometimes it's a true reforming uh, situation, um, for there to be a battle between um, you know, different points of view, even within the same religion. Sure. Karen and then Cindy? I'm wondering if perhaps they wanted to make a differentiation between images of like things like the cherubs and whatnot that were meant to be art and those that were like the idols that Rachel stowed away that were meant to be worshiped. Maybe so. Or maybe there was the authorized statues and the unauthorized statues. You know, the, the, the cherubim on the ark are commanded by God, that's allowed. But the idols you make for yourself or to worship other idols, that's too far. Cindy, go ahead. I think that some of it might have been uh, almost an attempt to control what was going to happen anyways. Um, you know, I mean, if okay, fine. If you're going to make bronze sculptures, then this is what it needs to be. Or, you know, okay, fine. If you're going to spend your gold making an item, make it for the temple because now it's sacred. It's part of our inventory. It's, you know, it, it's something that they could... I don't necessarily want to say like, you know, keep their thumb on people because that sounds kind of malicious, but it's you know, they, they were the, the power, you know, they were the power structure and right. It's that's channeling a way to keep the a impulse, hold of it. right? It's it's directing the impulse in a way that's appropriate, commanded, manageable, uh, defined. Um, in fact, it's interesting, the uh, artist who is commissioned to do all this gold work and design is named Bitzalel. And you may know that the major art academy in Israel today is called the Bitzalel Art Academy, named after the artist who creates all these things as commanded in the Hebrew Bible. I mean, I'll also point out, you know, hypocrisy is, is a plausible <laughs> explanation, you know, that, well, we're allowed to do it, but you're not allowed to do it. Or we can do it because our God said so, but you can't do it because your God's. I mean, that, that does happen occasionally in human life. Um, and then the, the last example is perhaps you're allowed to make the oxen and you're allowed to make the cherubim the angels but you can't make a human form male or female because remember in what image was the human form made if you go back to Genesis we are made in the image of God and so if you make a human form that's like making an image of God and you saw no form it says in Deuteronomy in that later version so Maybe they would make a distinction between animals or angels or other beings, but the human form might be the red line that you cannot cross. And so some people have assumed that that was perhaps the line, that Jews didn't make pictures of the human form. And then, darn those archaeologists, they kept digging. And guess what? They found plenty of examples of Jewish figurative art, even of human beings. So here is one. This is a synagogue called the Dura Europus Synagogue, which, alas, is in Syria and may not even be standing anymore. Um, this is an artist's recreation of the panels that were on the walls at the Dura Europus Synagogue. This uh, would appear in the uh, Diaspora Museum, which you can uh, visit now. It's reopened if you can get into Israel um, as a tourist. But um, what you, you already see, just from the overview of the, at the great distance, the wide variety of human forms and biblical scenes that are being depicted with human figures. So here we have some examples. Uh, this is David the king. I have a bigger version here. Here's Joshua represented in this fresco. Again, you know, painted on wet plaster so it dries very hard. Here we have, you can try to guess, it's the Jews crossing the Red Sea. Being pursued by Pharaoh, you have Moses lifting his staff 
You see the armies coming and then the armies drowning in the sea when he lowers his staff. Remember, it's Hebrew, so you've got to read left to right. <laughs> so on the left, you've got the armies, and then on the right, you've got the armies drowning. I will also point out, do you notice something above? We have hands, right? Well, that's, again, what, what? You saw no form, but maybe you saw a form. Here we have a famous scene. This is Miriam and Moses' mother taking him to be hidden in the basket. Remember, left to right. So you've got little naked Moses going in the basket. And guess who's pulling naked Moses out of the river? Naked Pharaoh's daughter. In a synagogue? Yes. Here we have a picture of the miracle of Elijah where the sacrificial animals were doused and doused with water and then he nevertheless caused divine fire to come and set it ablaze. Here we have the binding of Isaac's story. Let's see what elements you can notice here that are part of the binding of Isaac's story. I'll give you a second to look at that. Okay. So what did you see in here that's the binding of Isaac? You've got Abraham with the knife. You've got Isaac bound on the altar. You've got the voice from heaven or even a hand from heaven, you'll notice. And then in the foreground here, we have the ram caught by his horns in the bush. Here we have a depiction of the uh, temple in Jerusalem with the seven candled menorah next to the binding of Isaac on the right. And notice, why is that connected to the temple? Because it was that mount and supposedly that rock in the Dome of the Rock where the almost sacrifice took place. And here we have David the king being anointed with oil by Samuel, chosen from all, among all of his brothers to be, uh, to be the future king. So you see, here's part of the uh, Esther story where Mordecai is being ridden on the white horse. And uh, this is really striking, the degree of human forms, even naked human forms, that are being employed to depict biblical scenes. Fast forward about 400 years, or 300 years rather, to the 6th century of the Common Era, and here we have a synagogue in the land of Israel in the north called Beit Alpha. And you see this mosaic floor that survived. Now you'll see the remnants of columns here. Unfortunately, Dury Europus is very unique, you can't be very unique, is amazing and unique because the walls were still standing. In most cases for ancient buildings, the walls fall down and you lose them, but the floors survive. And here we have beautiful mosaics on the floor of the Beit Alpha Synagogue. Here we have a dedicatory inscription thanking the donors who gave money and the artists. Again, nothing new under the sun, says Ecclesiastes. Here we have again a depiction of the binding of Isaac. And you'll even see, if you read Hebrew, the name Yitzchak and Avraham, Again, you have lines coming from the sky and even a hand reaching out. And here is the ayil, here's the ram stuck in the, um, in the bushes. And you have the two young men who came with Abraham holding the donkey on which they traveled with Isaac right here near the altar with the fire. So again, a dramatic moment, a very important moment in Jewish thought depicted with human forms. And again, notice the style of the human form is very different than the style that was used to paint in the Dury Europa Synagogue. Again, what are the influences here? The surrounding cultures. The style of painting used in Dury Europa was very, looks very Roman, Greco-Roman. Living near Antioch, that was the major Roman city in Syria at the time. This seems much more a Byzantine style in some ways. And we also have on the floor of the synagogue, anyone have a guess? Anyone want to guess what this might be? The Zodiac. Zodiac. <laughs> the Zodiac. That's right. You can see the twins, right? You can see Pisces, the fish. You can see the uh, crab of cancer. You can see um, the lion of Leo, right? Um, you see the scales on the bottom. So this is the Zodiac with the four different seasons and the four corners. And the sun god in the middle with his chariot. What kind of a synagogue are they running here? <laughs> with the zodiac, what? Well, 
this was evidently not seen as, for, as, as forbidden as it would be in later Jewish culture. You would not see a synagogue today that would put the zodiac on their floor in any part of the Jewish world. But at this time, it was part of the surrounding culture. And so it was seen as appropriate to include the zodiac in the synagogue. Here again, you have depictions of the temple. You have the Lion of Judah represented on either side. And again, you've got the seven candled menorah. Now, these are being built after the temple's been destroyed, but the temple iconography still remains as an important and meaningful symbol for these Jews. And just to fast forward a little bit, this is an example of a painted synagogue that is reconstructed from records that would have stood in Poland. This is at the Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw, where they've rebuilt this space. And hopefully you can see this uh, zooming in a bit. You see beautiful colors and ge geometric designs. You do see some animals. I don't think you see any people's forms. I think that was thought to be too far beyond the pale by this time in Jewish thought. But again, still depictions of animals are allowed here. And again, beautiful geometric forms and calligraphy writing are all part of the decorative design. I mean, if I had to attend a synagogue like this, even for an Orthodox service, that might be very attractive to do. Now, of course, Jewish culture was not limited to creating in um, buildings and architecture. It was also within the frame of the book. By the Middle Ages, Europe had developed a phenomenon called the illuminated manuscript, where you not only had the words of the Holy writings, but also beautiful decorations, calligraphy, highlighted first letters, and so on, all the way through the book. You see this in Christian art history all the time. Well, guess what? Jews did the same thing. They started illuminating manuscripts, and one of the most popular manuscripts to illuminate was the Passover Haggadah. And so what I'm going to do now is share with you a PowerPoint presentation going through the history of the Haggadah, and you'll see some of the really striking designs that became part of Jewish ritual. Now, I will point out these are all hand-drawn in most cases, and so they were for a very select elite. This was not a broad art form. But we can imagine if the elites had it, then perhaps others did as well. So here are some handwritten Haggadot from before the print era. Here you see a picture of the Tom, the simple son, She'eno Yodea, who does not know how to ask. Uh, but you see, again, pictures of the human form, and also this beautiful gold leaf illuminating the, um, the text. This is from Spain in the 1300s. Here we have something called the bird's head Haggadah. This is a very interesting combination of prohibition and permission because you have the human form, but they don't have the human face because the human face, again, is thought to be the image of God, so instead they replace it with the face of the bird. But you'll also notice some interesting details here. For example, the hats that many of the characters are wearing were actually traditional for Jews to wear in Germany in 1300. And so they project them back into earlier stories like, for example, the bottom of the page you have again Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac with now the angel, clearly marked by the wings, telling him to stop. And again you have the ram stuck in the bush to the left. So here again you have depictions of forms, but not necessarily human faces. Oh, why is it going backwards? Oh, I see why. Here again are more pictures from the birds at Haggadah. Here you see them actually harvesting, uh, receiving the Ten Commandments and passing them down to Aaron and so on. Um, you see people harvesting the manna from heaven. This is all part of the uh, retelling of the stories. Here you have people actually depicted baking matzah as part of the current observation of the holiday. Here is something called the Golden Haggadah from Prague. Here again you get wonderful depictions of biblical scenes. You have uh, carrying out the body of uh, Joseph after the firstborn have died. You see the firstborn death in the upper right corner. And then you have the Jews leaving. You have Pharaoh's armies pursuing in the bottom right. and. You have, again, the waters crushing down over them and drowning them as Moses lowers his hand. Notice the decorations, though. I mean, Pharaoh's army looks like crusaders, right? But again, this is designed in the 1300s. They're not thinking historically. They're thinking contemporaneously. And again, they're definitely using human forms. 
Here we have one from Barcelona, again showing the four sons or the four children with the four cups of wine that are part of the Haggadah. Notice the beautiful declaration, uh, a decoration of the text in the bottom left. In the text there, if you can read the Hebrew, Hashana Haba'a Beyerushalayim Amen, the very end of the Haggadah. Here we have something called the Kaufman Haggadah, not as well preserved, but you'll notice, again, the decoration of the people, their clothing, the buildings, are reflecting the surrounding culture, not just some concept of historic old Jewish practice. Here we have one from Germany in the 1400s, and if you know anything about the frontispieces of Christian books, you'll see very similar scenes with a major um, picture with all kinds of decorations around the side with a text in the middle. Now this particular text is interesting. It's the part of the Haggadah, Shefuch Hamadcha Al Hagoyim, pour out your wrath upon the other nations. It's cursing everyone else who hates the Jews, and so this is hating them back to some extent. Here we have the Sarajevo Haggadah with beautiful illuminations. We'll see a couple examples of pictures in it uh, later in just a bit. Uh, this is the Halachma, this is the bread of affliction. But again, notice they've decorated it almost as if it's like Jerusalem itself with a wall and turrets around the text. Here's again from the Sarajevo Haggadah, detail of the Hebrews passing to freedom between the waters. Here's one from Hamburg where you have Moses and Aaron at the very beginning. This is the Seder Haggadah Shel Pesach, the uh, Passover order. Um, and again, depicting these core scenes in Jewish life with human faces and forms. Now, they're not all beautiful. I mean, this one is called the Yaknea Sagada, but you notice the face is not beautifully well drawn. That's okay, too. There's even some with graffiti, and there's some with food stains, because these were used for a living Haggadot. By Moravia, again, you notice the illumination is more plants and decoration, less human forms here, and much more focused on the beauty of the lettering. And here, if you read the text on the bottom, you might recognize Ma Nishtana Halayla Hazeh Mikol Halelot. Why is this night different from all other nights? When we get to printed Haggadahs in the printing era. Again, you'll see woodcut figures of human beings that are included in these, again, following other models. Here again, pour out your wrath upon the nations, but you see Jerusalem being cursed and someone blowing the shofar, hoping, hoping to draw the Messiah back. Here is one from Venice that depicts actually the different steps of the Seder with an actual depiction of what happens at each of those steps at the beginning of the Haggadah. Here is one representing uh, Moses and Aaron again. You can see Moses because of the rays of light coming out of his head, which Michelangelo depicted as uh, horns coming out of his head, but you try and depict rays of light in a sculpture. It may be hard to do. Um, and this is again published in Amsterdam by, uh, uh, by the end of the 17th century. Here again, you see the beautiful illumination around the page. Um, here's one in Frankfurt again, uh, one in London that's printed. Here's one in Casablanca that actually has an Arabic translation, uh, but Arabic in Hebrew letters, so a kind of Judeo-Arabic. Uh, but again, with pictures of the human form uh, and animal forms as well. This is the Chad Gad Yah story, the one little goat at the end. Um, this is one in Berlin that was printed. Here's one from Iraq. Now notice, Iraq is deep in the heart of the Muslim world, and so you're not going to see human forms. You do see plants and geometry and beautiful lettering and colors. That's part of what could be included in the artistic vocabulary of that time and place. Now, we understand that the human desire for creativity is not limited and will come out. It will come out despite prohibitions. It will come out working around prohibitions. And when we enter the modern period, we have an explosion of Jewish artists. We can think of Chagall and Modigliani and Camille Pizarro and all kinds of other creative artists, not to mention all the beautiful Israeli art that's been done since the start of the Zionist movement in the 1890s and people moving to Israel and trying to create in a new vocabulary of art based in the land and in the Hebrew language and so on. Um, there's wonderful paintings by Shmuel Bach, who's a Holocaust survivor, that grapple with what it means to have survived the Holocaust. Uh, we had a chance to talk about that in our adult ed class that explored the Holocaust in the past. Um, and, of course, there is the famous Marc Chagall. Uh, I'd be remiss to talk about Jewish art and figurative art without talking about Marc Chagall. And so here, uh, i just show you as one example, this is more of the Sarajevo Haggadah where you see these biblical scenes being depicted again. Here's Noah and the ark, um, and here's Noah's son seeing him naked. Uh, again, you have to read sort of right to left. 
Uh, there's Moses on the water and then being found. There they didn't include a naked, uh, they didn't include a naked Egyptian in this version by the Middle Ages, um, and so on. So th at the last, a little on Mark Chagall. So here we have the classical Chagall of people floating in the air and doing odd things. But of course, we also have a number of pieces that are deeply rooted in Jewish life. This is a famous one, Jew in Black and White, which I believe is at the Chicago uh, Institute of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago. Clearly a very Jewish picture that he would have known from his childhood and youth growing up in Eastern Europe before moving to Paris to become a full-time artist. There's also this picture called White Crucifixion, where you see very, very interesting imagery here. You'll notice again you have Jews floating in the air with tefillin and prayer boxes on covering their eyes. You see the burning of synagogues and the destruction of synagogues here with the Romanian flag in the background because of pogroms happening in Romania. You see people fleeing on boats and running to save Torah scrolls. And then you see this figure in the middle, which is clearly a Jesus on the cross wearing a talus to cover himself. It's quite a moving image. And then, of course, one of the most famous images of Chagall I don't have on this page. It's a picture of the violinist floating in the air and the violinist sitting on a roof, also known as a fiddler on the roof. The fiddler on the roof does not appear anywhere in the stories of Sholem Aleichem about Tevye the milkman. There's no fiddlers and there's no roof. And there's no fiddlers on the roof. But in the artwork of Marc Chagall, in his sort of magical, dreamy creativity, impressionism, whatever you call it, he became the model for the musical. <laughs> and the sets were designed to look like a Chagall piece. And the central metaphor of the fiddler on the roof comes from artwork and imagery made real on the stage instead. Now, defining Jewish art in these earlier periods was much easier because it was in a Haggadah. <laughs> it was used for Passover. It's depicting a biblical scene. It's done by Jewish artists for Jewish consumption. The captions are in Hebrew. But defining Jewish art today may be more challenging. After all, Modigliani was a Jewish artist. He did a lot of portraits. But is it clear that his portraits are Jewish art? Or are they just art done by a Jewish person? Well, with that, I want to stop talking and again open up to you for your thoughts on defining Jewish art today, where looking back, we, it, there is no debate that Jews have a long and rich history of figurative art of the human and animal form. The question is, today, how might you define what would count as Jewish art? I would say that um, what distinguishes Jewish art, you know, historically from today is that having distinctly and um, specifically Jewish communities, you know, now that there's not really a shtetl, if something isn't like explicitly made for the Jewish community depicting, you know, Jewish images and Jewish culture, it's very hard to call it Jewish art, I would think. Okay, so maybe the, the directed audience is important. Maybe the use of it is important. You know, doing a beautiful Kiddush cup that's designed for Shabbat, you know, maybe that's fair to call that Jewish art. Um, even if it's a non-Jewish artist, it doesn't matter. In fact, I'm doing a, a wedding on Sunday for a Jewish groom and an Indian bride, and they made a point of telling me that the Kiddush cup we're using belonged to a Jewish grandfather, but it says made in India on the bottom. So it's a bridging point of the two families on some level. Other thoughts on how you might define Jewish art? You could say it's what Jews subject, appreciate. <laughs> I think the subject has to be a, a Jewish based subject, not the artist. I don't think that to, to change the uh, a little bit, uh, uh, White Christmas is not a Jewish song, even though it was written by a Jewish man. 
they, I would say art has to be, the subject is what has to be of a Jewish thing. That would be my definition, not the art. And a, and a non-Jewish person could, could certainly create Jewish art. Okay, okay. Again, it might be different in a gallery versus in a synagogue, or you know, there can also be an irony. If I did a Buddha statue, you know, am I making an ironic commentary on idolatry and worship, or am I just experiencing another culture? I see Karen unmuted herself as well. Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I have a lot of what I consider Jewish art in my home, but it's things like a ketubah, mm -hmm. um, menor menorahs, um, I have a mezuzah collection, like for my daughter, she had little ballerina slippers when she was young. And then when she got older, we changed her mezuzah out. <laughs> so I think we have a way of making everything that's important to us artistic. You know, I have a Lennox Kiddush cup. So, you know, I think it's, it's important to make those things that we consider sacred to be beautiful. And that's where the art, art comes in. Sure. There's even a concept of what's called Hidur HaMitzvah, which is the sort of embellishing, the making special something. So if, don't just use a, a clay cup. Use something nice that's really beautiful and adds to the enjoyment of uh, celebrating the, the sharing of wine at a holiday and so on. Absolutely, that's part of it. I've even heard of, you know, uh, in uh, some Orthodox Jewish homes, they have pictures of the, the central rabbis of their particular style of Judaism uh, decorating their walls. That's part of their sense of art, um, is the ideal figures for them. But I know people that might have pictures of Martin Luther King Jr. on the wall, or pictures of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You know, we, we each have our heroes that we want to represent uh, you know, our sense of values. Uh, Cindy, please go ahead. Uh, I actually would apply it much more broadly um, to kind of twist what what our congregation applies towards. Are you, are you Jewish? You know, you are if you say you are. You are if you feel you are. You know, the same kind of goes for art. If, if the art that, you know, I make or you make you know, is about flowers or dogs or, you know, something that's not specifically religious, if we feel like, you know, that creation is Jewish, you know, kind of by extension, the way that, you know, you might think it's French art or whatever, you know, then that's valid. And, you know, at the same time, you know, if you're, you know, it, it, if your cup comes from a factory in India and, it wasn't intended that way, but you use it in that manner, you appreciate it in that manner, then it's Jewish. It, it's about, I think, how it's intended and how it's perceived. You know, I, uh, when we were in Michigan on a vacation near the end of the summer, we went to one of these craft art stores and I decided to try my hand at painting something and I did a tree and it came out reasonably good. I was actually pleasantly surprised. It wasn't worse than I feared. Um, now, does that make it Jewish art? I was, you know, doing a craft project. Now, if I titled it the Tree of Life, right, or the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil, or Adam's Tree, or Eve's Tree, you know, the, the framing of it makes a difference. So it's not just the object or the author, it's also the, the intent and the, and the way it's designed and, and the way it's used, as, as people have said. A Ken and then Victoria. You didn't raise your I didn't read so, so one thing that I observed in your slideshow was one of the earlier slides, the, the, uh, as part of the, um, the Haggadah story, they looked very Semitic and they had depicted people, even though it was one of the, the earliest ones, the, the drawings looked very Semitic and I, found that interesting that it, you know, the forms, the facial features um, looked, you know, authentically Semitic and, and I appreciated that. And well, I think some of them were actually done in Muslim empires too. They weren't only done in Christian Europe. So right. they might've had more Middle Eastern, you know, dress and style to draw on. 
Right. So so it just seemed uh, more contextually accurate. Mm -hmm. um, and then later on, as they're getting away from the forms or, or breaking away from human imagery, um, you know, that that's being severed. And so when you go back to the Mark Chagall stuff, it's it's almost a return to form. And the fact that the the people, whether they're floating or, you know, in these weird poses, there's still a certain amount of um, identifiable features that say this is not a, um, you know, a, you know, the, the, the forms are much more Semitic in nature and that and I think that's intentional um, and it clues the observer into something if you're, you know, if you're paying attention to that. Sure. And so, so when you're talking about like Jewish art, I don't know. I mean, that, that's kind of like, that's heavy handed to me. Um, it's, it's a, you know, is this Jewish? I don't know. Well, but keep in mind it, also you can cross list something. It right. can be both Jewish art and French art or American art or women's Shh. art. Or, you know, it's, uh, we don't have to fit in one category anymore. It's called hyperlinking. Right, exactly. So it's like there's definitely elements. And, and I know, you know, from, from other discussions, um, thank you, Cole Hadash, that Mark Chagall didn't always want to be associated as a Jewish artist. Um, that he was an artist first and Jewish kind of like, but it influenced him. Um, right. So, so I think that that's, you know, um, that's part of it. Sure. So. Great. Thanks. Uh, Victoria and then Emma. Oh, did Victoria drop out? I think, no, no, I was muted in that. Yeah. Um, I think that the, you know, the intent of the artist and the interpretation of the audience, like it's okay if it doesn't match, you know, but I, but I also know that there's this, uh, it's very tempting to sort of project onto it what you identify with. So maybe art that Jewish people might say that's Jewish art, I'll find a reason why. Because we like to uh, connect with it to associate with it. You know, I think of like all of the as I'm knitting, right? This is like what my grandmother did and what all her sisters did. And it's a connection to the past. I love to create things. So it's it's a very, you know, I feel connected. Could I say that this is like a Jewish art? It's not a Jewish art form. Um, and, but I think it's a big temptation of the audience to want to find a way to connect with it and sort of project something of ourselves into it, whether that was the intent or not. Sometimes it's fine. Maybe sometimes it's not fine because the artist is still around to say, you got it wrong. You know, that wasn't what I had in mind at all. Well, it's like that uh, scene in uh, Woody Allen's uh, Annie Hall where um, he brings out Marshall McLuhan to, to point out to the guy, you have no understanding of my work at all. <laughs> also, it's funny because I think of the scene from Seinfeld where Kramer has his art opening, but instead of going into the room where his work is, first they get at this empty room with just an exit sign over the door, but the people think that that's the exhibit, and then they talk about how brilliant it is, the empty room with the exit sign, which was, in his, you know, you also were influenced by what we've already her, like this idea that the person, if this person is recognized as a great artist, then people don't want to necessarily say, I thought that one thing that they did was completely terrible. You know, you don't want to be the one person to say that because the response is often, well, that's because you didn't understand it, right. of the genius of it, right? Exactly. Okay, Emma, and then Marlene or Earl. Well, it's not Emma, but... Okay. Um, I was just thinking that over time, of course, the artist's work was commissioned sometimes by wealthy patrons who uh, maybe had their own ideas of what should be presented and how. 
Uh, not always the case, but maybe over centuries that's changed. I get to talk next. Sure. I mean, that's absolutely, you know, the, the, the uh, person who hires the artist is part of the factoring and, you know, is, is giving direction too. Yes, uh, Marlene or Earl, please. Uh, Earl wants to talk. Um, I get the feeling that art is reflective of the people and the surroundings a lot. Um, you mentioned earlier the finding of the, um, uh, the fertility gods. Right. In, in biblical times, oftentimes more than one god was uh, believed in. Uh, Baal was believed in. And there was lots of um, pictures of bulls. Of, of the god of bull mm -hmm. in, in religious art. Um, today, I think that we only have one god in Western civilization, and that makes depiction of religion a lot easier. Um, well, it depends on whether you're allowed to depict that god or not. <laughs> it, it's interesting, though, that most of the depictions of the people I see <coughs> look Western European. Um, and most of the biblical characters are Semitic, probably dark skin. Um, you very rarely see a dark skin Moses or a dark skin David. Um, yes, we should think about why that is. I, I think it's reflecting what we are. And the art right. is reflecting a lot of what we believe in. And what we believe in is us, not necessarily another. Well, and also I think we create art in our image. You know, just like in the Bible, God creates man in his image. Yes. Well, in this case, the artist created in our image. So that's why those Haggadahs had people in the dress of their day, with the architecture of their day, with the Jewish markings of their day. Um, they wanted the, the ancestral people to look like them. Um, I mean, you'll even see this in, in you know, less historically minded people who would think that you know, Moses wore a black hat and a long black coat and a long white beard and that, that's what Moses looked like. Um, but the reality is Jews look different today in different parts of the Jewish world. Yemeni Jews and Ethiopian Jews look very different from European Jews from Poland. And my father's family is from Syria. They look somewhat different from Jews from Morocco and North Africa. And the reason why they look different, I will give it up. It's not a secret. It's because they married local people. <laughs> it wasn't the food. It wasn't the water or the air. It was the genes that they mixed together. And that's why Jews look different in different parts of the Jewish world. So when we're making Jewish art, we have to remember that Jewish art might not look like us. Because the Jewish people has always been diverse, not to mention people who joined the Jewish family who come from all different walks of life that had no historic connection to Jewish life, but they as an individual have been drawn into it by marriage or by personal journey. So what Jews look like today in Jewish art of today may be radically different from what it looked like centuries ago, and that's reflecting who Jews are today. Mm -hmm. So just as we'll broaden our horizons with Jewish music next month, we can broaden our thoughts of what it looks to look Jewish or do Jewish today. And I'll add one last thought to conclude. About 15 years ago, around the time I first came to Chicago, Spurtis Institute, which at the time was called Spurtis Museum, had an exhibit they called Post-Jewish Art. And it got a lot of people mad. Because they said, what do you mean post-Jewish? Either you're Jewish or you're not Jewish. What do you mean post-Jewish? And some of the figures actually had Jewish themes included in the art, but the point of the artist was, that's part of my background, but I'm not only defined by that. I'm not doing just Jewish art, this is post, this is beyond just Jewish art. And one last figure. I don't have an image to share with you. Um, in fact, I could find one if I look quickly. Um, it's a beautiful sculpture that was made by an, a woman artist. It's called Tefillin Barbie. Now, some of you might know, oh, here we go. Some of you might know that uh, Tefillin are these prayer straps that are um, cast onto a person's arm uh, so that it's bound to their head and bound to their forehead to fulfill a commandment in the Hebrew Bible uh, to take the words of the Shema and apply them to oneself. 
And so here we have an artist who took a beautiful Barbie doll, wrapped it in tefillin and in a prayer shawl, covered her head, and gave her a section of the Talmud to be reading. This is tefillin Barbie. This is fantastic. <laughs> Here's a whole series of images like that. Because what it's doing is taking Jewishness and claiming it for today because Jews look like Barbie too. <laughs> they don't only look Semitic. Um, and so if Jews look different, then Jewish art will look different too. After all, we're not just the people of the book as if there's only one. We're the people of the books, many of them, and some of them are coffee table art books too. 